ladies and gentlemen, this man, Bill Belichick. Yeah! yeah! All right, Pat. Coach, uh, hey, you got some stuff behind you, Coach. There's wow. some things behind you there. I don't know if you knew that. that that's my bling. Okay. That's yeah. my fingers. That's my bling. Uh, Coach, I just announced to the world something that we've been chatting about for like the last month and a half or so. So incredibly pumped and thankful that you'll be joining us next Thursday night in Detroit for the countdown and for the draft. In your wildest dreams, could you imagine your first live event post-coaching, maybe – you know, in the year off of coaching, being with a bunch of idiots uh, like our particular show. And why did you agree to do this with us? We are so incredibly thankful. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it's always a draft day, draft weekend is always uh, an exciting time uh, for everybody, for the teams that are building their teams and for the fans and for everybody involved in it. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great event. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it, you know, from the other side. It'll be fun to be in Detroit, you know, be with you guys and uh, – and get your expertise. Oh, whoa, whoa, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, you no, don't no, need no, that no. now. Okay, we don't need that type of chatter now. Um, yesterday was your birthday. Happy birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Coach. Happy birthday, Coach. Happy birthday, Coach. Another- yeah, we called the fire department to put out the candles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them, obviously a lot of them. You've done yeah. great in this entire thing. I chatted with you yesterday, and uh, I said, what are you doing? And you said, I'm watching film. What do you think this entire thing is? This draft year. Are you are you still studying all the uh, draft prospects? Are you watching? What is what is life like for you right now? And what has it been like for the first time in 49 years, not in an NFL building, and for first time in 48 years, uh, not a part of the draft in the NFL? Yeah, well, it's sort of like what I've been doing, you know, watching watching the players, uh, you know, specifically the ones that might be involved in our uh, in our show. So the guys in the top you know, top part of the draft. Um, but the first round leads into the second round, and, and there's a lot of correlation there. So uh, we'll talk about that next Thursday night. But, uh, yeah, just trying to just trying to do some preparation and, um, you know, follow up. I watched a lot of these guys in the fall and, and uh, even some from last year when they were juniors or when they were under – they weren't coming out, but they were still factors in evaluating the players uh, in, the, in the 23 draft. So uh, it's just kind of an ongoing process. And uh, – yeah, it's fun to keep up with. I always enjoy the this part of the part of the season. Well, we'll be thankful for it. Mm-hmm. Uh next Thursday as we're getting intel from a man who's obviously done everything in the NFL and had success at all different levels. They're chit-chatting about, you know, O tackle draft uh deep, wide receiver, deep. A lot of these mocks are coming out right now and I know that there's a lot of different thoughts about it all, especially from the media world. How much should we be paying attention to all these people in the next week and a half leading up to this thing? And is the O-Tackle wide receiver the group that is going to be stealing the show whenever we come to next week's first round? Well, I definitely think there's a lot of depth at those two positions. Um, you know, they're, they should go quite deep into the first round and probably um, carry over into the second round. I imagine there are teams near the top of the draft that are – uh, looking at uh, filling one position in the first round and then either coming back and getting a uh, wide receiver or tackle in the second round, you know, assuming that somebody will be left. But you never know. Draft's always full of surprises. It could go a lot of different directions. But, uh, you know, doesn't look like, uh, you know, a lot of tight ends or running backs at the top of the draft. And then defensively, uh, probably not the same depth on the board that there was uh, last year, the last couple of years, uh, at least not at the top. So, um but it'll always be interesting to see how things work out and, and trades can, you know, that can skew it a little bit. But um, overall, you know, a lot of, as usual, a lot of good young prospects. And uh, I would say that, you know, just at this point in time, a little over a week from, from the first round, um, I think teams are probably starting to really get things pulled together now. There's just a ton of information that comes in there in March and April when all your scouts are out, probably at least a, a dozen scouts on every team. Uh, so multiply all the information times, you know, times 12 or so of reports coming in, new information. And on top of that, you've got the medical, you've got the security, uh, you've got the, um, you know, all the scouts reports all being compiled and accumulated. And now this last week, uh, 10 days or so is where you really sit uh, as an organization and, and sort through it and sift it out. And um, there's always a little bit of contradiction, but you got to figure out where you're going to you know, where you're going to place your chips, uh, what you're going to believe, what you're not going to believe. And um, I'd say the biggest uh, the biggest newsmakers here quietly are the agents. Uh, nobody wants their player to get picked higher than them. So 
Uh, a lot of the information, I think, that comes to the media about, um, you know, who, who's going to draft who, how high they're going to go, um, is, uh, you know, a lot of media driven. So, you know, when the agent hears, well, you know, my player could go anywhere from, uh, you know, the second or the third round, uh, you add one to that and say, well, you know, these GMs or these teams are talking about taking my guy in the first round. I've never <laughs> done that. I've never told an agent. I've never told an agent, hey, we're going to take your guy in this round. We're going to take your guy with this, you know, with the 27th pick or the 31st pick or whatever pick it is we have. Um, I, I don't think there's too many teams that do that. I, but I think the agents will say, hey, my guy's going to go at 31 to this team. My team guy's going to go at 17 to that team, uh, that type of thing. And then that just generates interest in their players. So uh, I think you got to so- sift that out. Uh, but as you get closer to draft day, sometimes – uh, teams get closer to figuring out what they're going to do. There is information that can leak out of the organizations in one way or another uh, that can give you some insight into what they're going to do. I think it's a little early for that, but when you get into the last, you know, I'd say 12, uh, 12 or less hours before the draft, uh, sometimes that information can be very, very accurate and uh, and helpful. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff, you know, that leaked out of your organizations. Yeah, that was much. what you guys were known for. <laughs> Leakers everywhere. Yeah, Everybody's over. leaking, leaking, leaking. We'll talk about a lot of the, you know, the draft myths. Like, are they drafting for needs or best available? And how about, like, narratives that we heard going into it? And we'll debunk uh, what an actual draft board looks like mm. in the countdown to the Draft Spectacular with Bill starting at 7.30 on Thursday, and then he'll co-host the entire Draft Spectacular with us on Thursday night. I assume what's going to happen in those first 30 minutes is <laughs> there's going to be a human that is going to point some things out that has maybe taken uh, place over the last couple of weeks, and then we're going to watch it unfold in yeah. real time for the next 10 hours. Are you ready? Hey! I know you and Nike are hanging out most times during this draft. This first <laughs> round is like 45 hours long, mm-hmm. Bill. 45 hours. You, I don't want you to have to go to the bathroom in the middle of this thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, trust me. I sat through a few of them. I'll be, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll be ready to go. It's, uh, it, it'll be interesting to, you know, talk about, you know, we'll have our own kind of draft room set up as if we were, you know, the 33rd team and uh, kind of watch the guys come off the board and talk about what other teams' needs are and uh, potentially if there are trade conversations and that type of thing going on, I, I think I can – you know, give a little insight into maybe what the conversations will be in those rooms. Made a few trades. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think you will. Go ahead, AJ. Ma- ma- Coach, maybe Andy you... and I can. Maybe Andy and I can work up a trade somehow this year. Mm. Oh, I like that news. I, I remember I... when Andy and I, Andy, Andy Reed and I switched spots in the seventh round to keep our streak going. <laughs> <laughs> just digging around. Yeah, just... yeah fun. <laughs> hey, Andy, we need to do this. Go ahead, AJ. Coach, when, uh, when you talk to these prospects at the Combine, when you get those 15-minute interviews, and when you bring them in for the, uh, the visits that you can as a team, what are you looking for? Like, what are you asking the guys? And can you really, like, how much information can you gather? Well, I think the 30 visits, uh, AJ, are a lot more valuable than the 15-minute ones. Um, you know, those 15-minute ones can be misleading. Uh, they could be real good or real bad, and that may, not, may or may not be indicative of the, what the player's real personality and, and – um, interaction is with the with the you know from that time uh because it's very it's very artificial he'll probably never be in that setting again where he's you know in front of a dozen executives and coaches from a team but the 30 visits are great um you know the 15 minute visits there give you a little bit of a chance to get to know the kid but the when you spend a whole day with him now those 30 visits could be uh for a lot of different reasons they could be uh you know you really want to dig more into the person uh, his football knowledge, his background, uh, medical is a part of that. Uh, sometimes it's for free agents, guys that you think aren't going to get drafted, but you want to recruit. And of course, when you sign a college free agent right after the draft, which there'll be you know several hundred of those signed, uh, a lot of those kids you won't have physicals on. The ones that didn't go to the combine, uh, unless you bring them in and do your own physical. So if you if you were you know have an interest in a guy uh, who's maybe a little under the radar, maybe a small school player or somebody like that and you don't do the physical on them, and then you bring them in after the draft, and you've already signed them, and you can't pass your physical, or you find out he has an issue that uh, you weren't expecting, and then you know, you've kind of lost a spot there. And uh, So uh, there are a lot of different reasons for those 30 visits. Uh, I'd say the guys that you feel like you know a lot about, uh, I'm not sure that there's a big reason to visit them. Mm. And I'd say, uh, generally speaking, that's not – uh, a high priority. You know, so just because the guy doesn't visit a team doesn't mean that team's not interested in him. 
they may know all they need to know about him and feel like they want to spend that visit on something that would be more productive. I don't know if you heard this or not. The Commanders actually hosted 20 guys mm-hmm. for uh, 20 of their 30 visits. 20 at the same time went to Top Golf last night. Mm-hmm. Went Sweet. to Top Golf last night. Has have you have you ever done any of that? You take them to Top Golf, maybe a little roller skating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, our <laughs> no, that wasn't. Uh, we weren't real big on that. Uh, it wasn't more of a recruiting for us. It was informational gathering but i think we had maybe as many as a dozen come in on the same day and a lot of times we'd combine the groups so uh quarterbacks tight ends receivers uh so that we could interact and and work with them uh individually but also collectively uh see them you know work together with each other the quarterback call play and a receiver talk about what he'd do on it and things like that or you know four or five six linemen at the same time so you could kind of uh you know be a little bit more efficient in terms of uh the staff time spending with them but uh, sometimes that's just dependent upon what the player's schedule is. And so some guys, you know, will take 20 or visits and other guys will have two or three. Uh, so scheduling sometimes becomes, a you know, a difficult part of those 30 visits. But, yeah, I can see bringing in a lot of guys at one time. It, it is an efficient way to, to, you know, use the use the visit time for your staff because uh, the more you tie your staff up on those visits and the less productive you can do be doing other things. Yeah, and that makes sense. You know, I uh, in the college world, I've gotten dropped in there. They have those recruiting weekends, you know, some of these schools. And it's like right. every weekend, mm-hmm. it's a recruiting weekend. And these coaches, like, you got to recruit via phone all week. You got to prepare for a team. And then you got a recruiting weekend. And, and then I talked to Oregon coach Dan Lanning. And, you know, Washington's probably going to be pretty similar with your, your son and the entire uh, crew up there with Fish. They schedule like one weekend because it's such a far trip. And it's like we have our recruiting weekend mm-hmm. with a lot of our recruits. And then it also frees up us for football mm-hmm. for all the other times. Not a bad concept. I don't think I'd heard of 20 visits. But if you're doing 12, okay, commanders, look at you guys. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> look at the commanders. they got to feel good about that. Now, a lot of those trophies. Well, well you know, one thing, Pat, uh, you know, when we look at our draft board on Thursday night, I think the one thing that everybody has to understand is our draft board will look different than every other draft board in the league, just like every team's draft board will look different than every other draft board in the league. Not any of them are the same. Even at the very top, they won't be the same. So um, what you're looking at is what you feel like is going to help your team and how you've got them organized, and and everybody else has that same view. So you can kind of think, well, this is what some other people are thinking, but you never really know that. And so – uh, the recruiting thing is a little bit the same thing, I'm sure. Uh, you know, I haven't done college recruiting, but I can imagine that, yeah, it'd be great to bring 20 guys in. But if you've got a top prospect and he can't come in that weekend, you're not going to drop him. Yeah. You're going to find another time when he can visit, when he can, you know, do whatever he does, bring his parents or, or girlfriend or whatever you can fit into his schedule. If he's good enough, you'll make room for him. So, uh, you know, a lot of that just depends on uh, – you know, how schedules work out in, in players that are in high demand. Hey, be who you can afford to be, Coach. Yeah. And uh, those <laughs> those trophies behind you right there provide yeah. a lot of happiness for this man that has a question mm-hmm. for you. He actually has – How about a, including the Emmy? Yeah. Oh, top, yeah. top 100? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. 100 me? years. All he right. lo- loved it all. Boston, that was fun. Uh, New England Patriot diehard, a man who has – We're on to Cincinnati tattooed on his bicep. Boston (laughs) Connor has a question for you, Coach. Yeah, Coach, it is an absolute honor. First of all, thank you for all the happiness and joy you have brought to me and all of New England throughout, you know, my entire life. And Pat is telling me to put my arm up right now. So, I mean, I'll show you. There it is, Coach! It's got got your full name. It doesn't say Bill Belichick. It says William Stephen Belichick. And, (laughs) yeah, my triceps do touch my butt cheeks. But, uh, Coach, one thing that always happened for New England, especially around this draft time, was – you know, we didn't get very excited as fans just because when you're picking so late in the draft, you know, first of all, Pat mentioned that you got to wait 45 hours to get to the pick. And then a lot of the times, you know, you would trade back or trade out of the first round because, you know, you, you just didn't ha- have anything to really take. What is the mindset going into a draft when you are picking that late? Because, you know, this is something that your your buddy Andy Reid has to deal with now because mm-hmm. they're going to be, you know, 28 and up going forward for the next, you know, 10, 15 years. Who knows? But what is kind of the thought process around that? And when do you know, like, during that first round, hey, we're trading out, there's there's no point to stay here? Right. (laughs) That's a great question. Um, And the answer is every year is different and you really don't know. Um, 
when you're picking at the end of the draft, uh, and I got this question, you know, from people in our organization and so forth a lot, uh, you know, what are we going to do? We're picking 28th, we're picking 32nd. You tell me who's going to be there, and then I can tell you what we're going to do, but you just really don't know. There's so many teams in front of you. It's just impossible to predict. So uh, did I think we would ever draft Vince Wilfork? I thought there was no chance he would be on the board when we picked. Uh, I didn't think Hightower would be there, so we traded up and got him. I didn't think Chandler Jones would be there, so we traded up and got him. Um, you know, Logan Mankins was there, and, and we waited it out and took Mankins at 32. But you just don't know what's going to be at the end of the draft when you're picking there. So sometimes you see somebody fall in and say, okay, I'll, I'll, it's worth it to trade and get up and get the guy. Uh, other times you kind of wait and see who slides through. Sometimes – uh, you feel like I'm taking this guy, you know, there's not much there at the end of the first round. Let me move back, uh, you know, a few spots and try to either, you know, accumulate some capital or, um, you know, take the same player or the same quality of player that you're going to take. You got two or three guys you like there. Uh, just back up and take a little bit more for it. I think the fifth year option is is an issue at the end of the first round huh. for the high priced positions. So obviously quarterback. Uh, which is what the Ravens did when they took Lamar Jackson. They traded in our spot at 32 to take Jackson and got the fifth-year option on him. Or cornerback, offensive tackle, uh, you know, maybe even pass rusher. But when you talk about the tackles and the pass rushers and the receivers at that point, you're probably talking about the fifth or sixth guy. Um, but, you know, look, if it's a guy who's going to end up making a lot of money at, that, at one of those high-quality positions, then it's worth it probably to be up in the first round and potentially have a fifth-year option. Um, so that's a, sometimes a factor, too. Of you, There's a little bit of savings from the first round to the second round because that fifth-year option is included in the first round. Now, Coach, I heard you're a bad drafter. That's yeah. what they yeah. say. Yeah. I heard you're a bad drafter, you know. It would be nice to maybe get a top-10 pick every once in a while, huh? but then the yeah. season would be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> what do we, we want to have? What do we not want to have? Uh, I love hearing you break. I've gotten a chance to chat with Coach now a few times over the last few weeks. Had a great dinner last Thursday night. I went to the bathroom four times. He didn't go to the bathroom once. Jeez. Do you remember that, Coach? You, do you, well, you, were, you were drinking more than I was. <laughs> I was hammering some Jack what? and Dines. I tried to get him an espresso martini. Found out he hates coffee. Okay. okay. Fair enough. Had no no idea. Right? Is that real? Absolutely. Never had a cup of coffee in my life. <sighs> That's awesome. This is at the beginning of the dinner. First time meeting him face to face. Waiter comes in. Will you guys be having drinks? He goes, sure. Well, do you have any specialty drinks? I'm like, we'll take two espresso martinis. And I was about to give you the full speech about, <laughs> hey, you got to get past. Just wait. You got to get past the name. <laughs> you got to get past the cup, the whole thing. And you go, absolutely not. I go, this is going to be a bad night. This be, I thought this was going to win the evening. And then you told me, I don't drink coffee ever. Never. I don't do it. I'm like, you don't drink coffee? Because tea and other things you do. Not a coffee guy. I think we all just assume because from the legendary tales that we've heard about the amount of film study mm -hmm. that you had to be just, you know, douche, douche, yeah. espresso, mm -hmm. espresso, coffee, complete opposite. That was a bad start. But I appreciate you taking time no. to kind of learn about me through this entire process and our show mm -hmm. and our show a lot. Yeah, well, Pat, I enjoyed being with you on with you in game day. I mean, that was awesome. You and Coach Corso and and uh, in the Army Navy setting, you know, nothing better than that. But um, yeah, you know, the the draft is a it's a fascinating uh, event, especially the first day. And, and uh, for the most part, teams have one pick. They have you know one choice there on Thursday night to you know do the best they can to improve their team, whatever that is, whether it's trade up, trade down, take a guy, whatever. And so it's, um, you know, it's, it's an exciting day. You want to try to make the most of it. Um, and, and honestly, you know, there are teams that look at it as they're willing to take more risk for more upside. Uh, and then other times you, you want the conservative pick and you want to, you know, I want to know that I got a good player. Uh, maybe there's another guy on the board. It could be, you know, great, but maybe there's more of a chance that he could also not work out. So no, um, no, these are all the, all pros, Hall of Famers, no matter what, all of them. Uh, well, that, that, look, we know historically <laughs> that the wide receivers and quarterbacks in the first round are, are really a 50 50 proposition in the long run. And so, hmm. you know, that's, that's what the stats will tell you. Uh, each year could be different. You know, it could be 83 and, and you could have, you know, five, five uh, franchise sure. quarterbacks. Uh, or you can end up with none. And so, you know, time will tell on that. But, you know, at this point, everybody's optimistic that the player will reach his potential. And that's why they're being picked. They're being picked because the teams want them.
Okay. Oh, I can't wait to experience an entire draft with you. We have a Pittsburgh Steeler fan who wants to ask you a question before we let you go. We're thankful for you. Yeah, Bill, I assume what next Thursday you're going to spell a lot of uh, myths and theories for us. But one of them is we always say, like, let's just say, like, the Raiders draft a, a DN, and we say, oh, well, that's because they have to get to Patrick Mahomes. They're drafting for the, their division. Is that actually a thing with teams in the draft room where you think about your division and draft for your division, or is that total bullshit? And last year, you know, when the Steelers traded up uh, with you guys to get in front of the Jets to take a tackle, was that to screw the Jets over in the division? Uh, and does that does the stuff like that happen in the draft? Right. Well, um, well, let me take the first question. The second question first. The Pittsburgh trade. Uh, we only traded back a couple of spots. Uh, we were pretty confident that the Steelers were looking for a tackle. And we were pretty confident that the Jets weren't going to take a corner because they had taken Gardner uh, the year before. And so we kind of thought that both teams were looking for the same thing. So uh, in the end, the Jets ended up taking a pass rusher. But um, we were really interested in the corner. We probably would have stayed there and taken Gonzalez if there hadn't been a trade available. Um, well, we would have done that. That's not probably. We would have done that. Um, but, you know, the option to move back a couple spots and um, – of course, we didn't know the Steelers were going to take the guy that the Jets wanted. I mean, I would say we weren't heartbroken that that happened, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Um, but, you know, in the end, we ended up getting the guy that we wanted with Gonzalez, and um, so that was so that was good. I would say the, the first question you asked is part of a much bigger question, and I think that's the question that, you, that each organization is talking about right now. What helps our team the most? Um, sure, part of it is your division. Part of it is your team. Part of it is the complementary parts of your team. Part of it's the salary cap. Uh, if you have somebody who's making a lot of money that you know you're going to have to replace for one reason or another, whether uh, you know they're nearing the end of the career or maybe their um, their contract's going to be up next year and you're not sure if you're going to be able to resign them, and if you do, it's going to cost a lot of money. That sometimes you draft players at that position to give you depth, you know, a year ahead of when you really need it, so that you know, financially, you can, you know, maintain a, a competitive team during that time. You put all those factors in there together and maybe there's an overriding factor. Maybe it's, you know, we got a, I know with Coach Parcells, uh, you know, one of the big things, again, this is a while back, but, you know, when we were playing, everybody was playing a 4-3-4, you know, one of Big Bill's things was you got to have a center. You got to have a good center. You know, all the teams in our division were, you know, we're playing 3-4 at one point. And, you know, we felt like we had to have a good center. So uh, sometimes the, the, the division thing is overriding, but I'd say there are a lot of factors that come into play in an organization and use that to decide, you know, what, what, how it all fits together. Coach, and I would say the draft, I would say the draft in the end is really, uh, is really it, it look at it like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. that, well, there's not one piece that puts the puzzle together. You look at everything. You look at the player's character, his mental, his intelligence, his work ethic, uh, his upside, his – you know, everything his all the things that factor into his leadership His, you know, what type of a uh, teammates he going to be all those things. And you have it and then you put it all together. And then that's the picture you have on the player, whatever that is. And then you give it a grade. It's worth a certain value to you. Um, you know, there's not many perfect players out there and, and all the best ones, you know, go in the first handful of picks. And then after that, there's always something with everybody that's, you know, but he might fit perfectly for your system and not as well for another team's system. So that's why I say the grades up there for each individual team are, are not the same. Uh, but yeah, it's, but it's coach, a mosaic. It's coach, a jigsaw puzzle. Coach, the day after the first round, though, yeah, great. we judged the draft immediately. Winners and exactly. losers. Yeah. Yeah. Winners yeah. and losers, losers, Coach. Right away. What are you talking about? Yeah, but you know as well as I do that, that the players that are there in the second round, a lot of those players were there on teams' boards in the first round. They didn't think they'd be there. They didn't think they'd make it till the second round. Uh, and so then all of a sudden, that's great value. It's like, yeah, but you don't pick. know, Coach. No way. <laughs> you don't know. That's the fun thing about us covering the draft as a, as a part of the media, you know? It's like the day after round one, the experts are all out. 
and the experts are all out just trying to figure out who was closest to what they were predicting yeah. to happen mm -hmm. and if they were far for them happening. And then all of a sudden you get entire team's fan bases pissed because of what the actual general manager did mm -hmm. versus what a mock drafter did on the internet. And it's like a fucking shit show. You're like, you can say fuck now, we're off ESPN. But it, it is a shit show <laughs> in this entire, if you, you don't, you won't. But if, if you, if you <laughs> want to let, you just let you know, it does slot, it, it will fly right now. But it's like, how quickly you think you can judge a draft? Like, when do you think is the pro? Is it like if a second contract comes, whether somebody's a bust or if they, if they play immediately, if it ends up working out? What are your thoughts on that entire thing, like of a, a successful draft for your team or for a team? Well, I'd say uh, for, in my experience, I think we've always drafted, we've always graded a player for really what, what, we, what we think they'll be in year two. What okay. will the player be in year two? Now, year two could be halfway through his rookie year. Year two could be, you know, a year and a half. It might not, you know, it might not be year two. It might be almost year three. I would say, but there's a point where the player figures things out. He gets in, he understands professional football. He's had a chance to train to, you know, physically develop to a point where he can be at a very high competitive point. And then what do you have? Um, and I could cite a lot of different examples, but uh, just going back to the Giants, um, you know, Phil Simms, everybody talked about Phil Simms, what a bust he was. Uh, and, and he was a great, great player. But he played, uh, you know, in some tough circumstances, his rookie and second year, um, had a couple unfortunate injuries. But Phil's a tough guy. He was a tough player. There was no softness in him. He was as competitive as they get. But the fans were on him, and we blew it on Phil Simms. We blew it on Mark Haynes. There's another guy who turned out to be an all-pro cornerback who didn't play his rookie year. Brady didn't play his rookie year, and, you know, we have Tom Brady. So uh, <laughs> you judge Tom Brady after his first year, and, you know, you have literally nothing. You know, we're talking about the greatest player that's, that's ever played. So uh, Lawrence Taylor was a different story. Lawrence Taylor from day one impacted the team, showed he was the best player on the field, way better than everybody else, and built the defense around him from that point going forward. So... It's different with different players, and, and, but I'd say once the player figures it out, once he's had a chance to physically develop, and again, especially for linemen, sometimes those guys need a little bit of time, or the technique on the offensive line in particular is something that can take a little bit of time. Quarterback's another position, uh, but once they figure it out, once they get, then that's when you know what you have, and it, it's usually not day one of his rookie year. I would say Lawrence Taylor would be the you know, kind of the one exception to that rule. But there's not too many guys, maybe, you know, like Goskowski, a kicker, you come in, Pat, you know, you come in and kick from day one. Uh, you know, if your skills are at a high enough level, you can see the impact already. But at a lot of the positions, it just takes a little bit more time. AJ, you know that. And Coach. Your, cell, your experience and the guys you played with. Coach, you're so wrong. I, I mean, <laughs> you're so wrong. What are we supposed to do on Friday? I've been told that a lot. <laughs> yeah, especially as of late. Bunch of bullshit. Yep. AJ has a question for you, Coach. Yeah, Coach, talking about the quarterbacks, why does it seem just so difficult to evaluate these guys and see success in college? Will it translate to the NFL? Like, I know there's a lot of factors, but what do you think makes that so difficult? I think that's what we're going to talk about in the pregame show because we got yeah. those quarterbacks coming up, and I, and I think we'll see uh, some easy. video of what they do well, what they have trouble with, what they need to work on. Uh, and what are NFL plays and what really aren't NFL plays? Because I'd say there's a lot of plays these quarterbacks make. They're just not going to make in the National Football League. Like, they're just not going to make. What uh, kind of plays? Uh, and then the ones that they will make, if you see them make those over and over again, I think that's a pretty good sign uh, that they can do it. And then I'd say there's other, there's other examples of players that if they can figure out how they need to play in the National Football League, they'll be really good. Uh, but it's not the way they played in college. It's just a different game. Yeah, everything's faster, bigger, stronger. And a lot of guys, you know, whenever you're talking like, I guess second on, and for you guys, you had starters in there, and I know Saban believes in this, but like special teams in a, is a way how a lot of people are going to make the team. Mm -hmm. And a lot of rookies don't know that. It's their first time taking a punt protection. And it's like, yeah, you're going to be in the NFL because of this. <laughs> well, no, I just led my college in tackles. Yeah. yeah, so did the motherfucker that's starting in front of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he did that as well. So it's like that old right. Pac-Man Jones, obviously special teams all pro, has a question for you, Bill. Coach, you was big in special teams. How do you feel that the new special team rules will affect the game? Well, first of all, Pac-Man, I want to tell you that that punt you returned against us with the Titans <laughs> 
was total BS. <laughs> Oh, that was we, a good it one. was third down, and I was standing there on the sideline, and I said, look, these guys can't move the ball. The only way they can score is if we punt it to Pac-Man and he returns it. So we are going out of bounds with this ball. It's right before the half. There's a minute to go in the half. I said, we are going out of bounds with this ball, and we're going to make them drive it because they can't score on our defense. And we punt it right down the middle, <laughs> and you go 85 yards – and I, I tell you, I can't remember a situation I have been more upset about. Than <laughs> and you killed us on that, just like I knew you were going to do. And I, before we even went on the field, it was third down we started talking about that. So I didn't get a chance to see you after the game, you know, because that was a tough game there. With, you know, a lot of things happened in that game. But you killed us on that play. So they killed a lot of people, you know, coach. Say, okay, so how's that going to affect us? I would say a couple things. Number one, it looks like it's going to include like another, I don't know, whatever the number is, called 1,500 plays in the game that we didn't have in the last league wide, right? That we haven't had in the last, you know, couple of years. So um, I think that there's more opportunity for players to play on special teams than there have been the last couple of years when literally 90% of the kickoffs are going out of the end zone. So I think that might affect the bottom part of the roster. And I would say with the new kickoff rules, because there's really no running involved, uh, the kicking team's already down there, the return team's already set up, uh, that there'll be more of an emphasis on size players in the return game than speed, uh, where you know, a lot of teams would cover with you know, six or seven DB wide receiver types uh, you know, with their kickoff unit. Uh, and and play with the same type of players on the kickoff return, play with a couple corners, a couple wide receivers on the front line that could run and get back and set up. Well, now uh, there's no need for that. You just need guys who can play at the point of attack, shed blocks, and, and defend their space uh, because of the new alignment. So I think it'll uh, increase the size of the players that are on the field, and I do think that because everybody is spread across the field, that if these returners – uh, and I think the Easter Turners, if they hit a little bit of space, they're gone because it's just going to be a lot harder to overlap than what it was in the past. I, I don't like that they took the surprise onside kick out of it, although I wish that rule had been out when we played against you, Pat, because we always had to put another two guys over there to handle the spike kick, even though you never did it against us, but you did it against other teams, and, and that always screwed up our kickoff returns. So I wish that rule had been in place when we played against you, but it wasn't. 